Uh, I'm very soon uh, letting the audience come with questions, but I, I'd like to ask you one question first, all three of you. Isn't maybe the case that, uh, that the most dangerous idea that we humans have invented is actually the idea of the paradise? Um, and, and it doesn't really matter if it is the paradise after life where suicide bombers do what they do to get there or the, the, the Catholic Church torture people who doesn't um, do the right thing and so on. Or if it is the paradise in this life that the communists or the Nazis or Pol Pot tried to create it. I mean, isn't it the same thing? The, the idea of utopia, the idea of the paradise, that is the actual dangerous idea in itself. Well, how do you comment on that? I mean, I think, uh, you know, yes, in a way that, that picks up what we were saying before about ideologies and religions mm. having a lot in common. Um, I suppose the difference is that, uh, you know, with, with the idea of an earthly paradise, uh, while I agree that that's an illusion and a very dangerous one, um, the idea that we can actually improve society is something that is uh, a, a valuable idea and something we should strive towards. So, uh, what you want to say is, well, um, you know, we can have some societies that are good or bad, and uh, no doubt say, you know, Sweden looks pretty good to many people who are living in some of the uh, poorer and less well-governed parts of the world today. Um, but you wouldn't say it was a paradise, but you know, you, well, how could you improve it? And you could think about ways of improving it. So I think uh, we have to carefully distinguish the desire for, for progress, um, what I think uh, Karl Popper once called piecemeal social engineering, um, to try and improve things, uh, which I think we should support, as against the idea that somehow if we impose great sacrifices on the present generation, we will get to some sort of paradise in some future generation. Mm. Okay. Um. I think you may have a point, actually, because I think if, if the idea of utopia is at the cost of, of some people, some mm. people that aren't desirable, um, it costs too much. And then mm. I think, in a, in, a, in a much more narrow and smaller view, I think that uh, a lot of us are striving uh, to nest our own small paradise at home. Mm. Um, <laughs> in a way that costs too much as well, in a way that makes us not see uh, that our own small paradises cost too much um, at our neighbor's expense, so to speak. Mm. It could be troublesome as well. Mm. Uh, I don't think that the modern utopias and uh, the paradise say, of medieval Christianity are similar uh, the modern utopias have proven uh, their terrible dangers in the 20th century uh, in the most awful way. I mean, you don't have to elaborate on that for sure. And I think all utopias of the perfect society and then the dictatorships that then evolve and believe that they can uh, implement that, uh, they have been the most awful lessons. But the uh, medieval paradise is a bit different. And uh, uh, to me, the concept is so interwoven uh, with uh, art and music and poetry and, uh, uh, for instance, I think that... Uh, uh, let, let, let me give you this little anecdote which I always like to quote because it has been written by a great essayist who was also a colleague, Louis Thomas. Uh, he's uh, uh, having the, his musings and his thoughts while listening to Mahler symphony in the middle of the night. And uh, then he suddenly asked the question, if we would have an opportunity to get in touch with an extraterrestrial civilization, which would be very far away, so a message would take thousands of years to arrive there. But we would have the possibility to send a, a car, the vignette, uh, to introduce our civilization to them. What would we send? So he says, but of course, Johann Sebastian Bach. And he says, no, we cannot do that because it would be bragging. Skryta. Uh, so, uh, I think, uh, uh, to me, the concept of paradise, which I uh, found deeply reprehensible when I read about it in Dante, whom I otherwise love, uh, that has the redeeming features of the, uh, the art and music 
uh, it has created. Not the repression it has created, because on the other side you have, of course, uh, these pictures uh, which you can see in the great palace of the Inquisition in Cartagena, uh, where uh, the torturers are pouring boiling acid in the ears of the condemned, and meanwhile praying for their soul, because that's going to paradise, and doing, they're doing a good thing for them. That's the other side, of course, of paradise. Uh, yet I, I do feel that it's like different, uh, it is different because I think it, I come back to this fear of death. It basically reflects the fear of death. And uh, when I listen to Bach Cantata and he says uh, that he is uh, happy to die, he, he is happy about the thought of dying, ich freue mich auf meinem Tod. Uh, it is totally genuine and totally real and uh, he can write that music because he believes in that. It's, it's different from the modern utopias, different from both Hitler and Stalin. Okay, so uh, we're going to open up for questions from, from the audience now. Ellis was the first, I think. I'll do the question in English. Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I come from the United States. But it's 36 years ago, and I'd like to direct my question to Professor Singer, but you others are, of course, welcome to comment also. You spoke about the doctrine of the sanctity of life, and you spoke about conception, and about abortion, and about euthanasia, and assisted suicide, and so on. But the death penalty wasn't touched on. And it's always amazed me that the most religious fanatics opposing any type of abortion or stem cell research or, or euthanasia and so on uh, are the ones who are so strongly in favor of the death penalty. <laughs> can you reconcile that in any way and in an ethical sense how they can justify? Perhaps uh, Professor Klein touched on it by talking about putting the boiling acid in the ears at the same time they were praying for their souls. They somehow managed to reconcile it, but I can't. <laughs> Well, I think, I think if you asked uh, the, the, the people themselves, <clears throat> they would say that they are opposed to the taking of innocent human life. And uh, the idea is that the death penalty does not take innocent human life. It takes those who are guilty and that this is acceptable. Now, I mean, I think there are problems. One of the problems, of course, is that we know that if you, you, know, if you execute a thousand people, um, even if they've all been found guilty by a jury of their peers, um, it's pretty certain that some of those a thousand will be innocent. Um, looks like, on as far as you can tell from statistics and the more recent uh, DNA evidence and so on, that even in the best system you might get half a percent, so one in 200, who is innocent. So if you really believe that it's a terrible thing to take innocent life, I would have thought uh, that risk should be enough to say that you shouldn't use the death penalty, especially as there's no evidence that the death penalty works as a deterrent anyway. Um, so, I am opposed to it, but I think if you ask the religious uh, why, they're, why they don't oppose it, they will say because it's the killing of the innocent we're against. And that, of course, goes back to the Lex Talionis in the Old Testament, which is a, a theory about balancing. Because when someone does something that uh, uh, disrupts the balance, balance in, in creation, you have to do something to put the balance back. So it's about eye for an eye, and as you say, of course, it's, this is not an innocent life, one argues. Uh, 